This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Mother Jones by Mother Jones. Chapter 13 The Cripple Creek Strike. The state of Colorado belonged not to a republic, but to the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, the Victor Company, and their dependencies. The governor was their agent. The militia under Bell did their bidding. Whenever the masters of the state told the governor to bark, he yelped for them like a mad hound. Whenever they told the military to bite, they bit. The people of Colorado had voted overwhelmingly for an eight-hour day. The legislature passed an eight-hour law, but the courts had declared it unconstitutional. Then, when the measure was submitted directly to the people, they voted for it with 40,000 votes majority. But the next legislature, which was controlled by the mining interests, failed to pass the bill. The miners saw that they could not get their demands through peaceful legislation, that they must fight, that they must strike. All the metal miners struck first. The strike extended into New Mexico and Utah. It became an ugly war. The metal miners were anxious to have the coal miners join them in their struggle. The executive board of the United Mine Workers was in session in Indianapolis, and to this board the governor of Colorado had sent a delegation to convince them that there ought not to be a strike in the coal fields. Among the delegates was a labor commissioner. I was going on my way to West Virginia from Mount Olive, Illinois, where the miners were commemorating their dead. I stopped off at headquarters in Indianapolis. The executive board asked me to go to Colorado, look into conditions there, and see what the sentiments of the miners were, and make a report to the office. I went immediately to Colorado, first to the office of the Western Federation of Miners, where I heard the story of the industrial conflict. I then got myself an old calico dress, a sunbonnet, some pins and needles, elastic and tape, and such sundries, and went down to the southern coal fields of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. As a peddler, I went through the various coal camps, eating in the homes of the miners, staying all night with their families. I found the conditions under which they lived deplorable. They were in practical slavery to the company, who owned their houses, owned all the land, so that if a miner did own a house, he must vacate whenever it pleased the land owners. They were paid in scrip instead of money, so that they could not go away if dissatisfied. They must buy at company stores and at company prices. The coal they mined was weighed by an agent of the company, and the miners could not have a check weighman to see that full credit was given them. The schools, the churches, the roads belong to the company. I felt, after listening to their stories, after witnessing their long patience, that the time was ripe for revolt against such brutal conditions. I went to Trinidad, and to the office of the Western Federation of Miners. I talked with the secretary, Gilmore, a loyal, hard-working man, and with the president, Howell, a good, honest soul. We sat up and talked the matter over far into the night. I showed them that the conditions I found down in the mining camps were heart-rending, and I felt it was our business to remedy those conditions and bring some future, some sunlight, at least, into the lives of the children. They deputized me to go at once to headquarters in Indianapolis. I took the train the next morning. When I arrived at the office in Indianapolis, I found the President, John Mitchell, the Vice President, T. L. Lewis, the Secretary, W. B. Wilson of Arnaud, Pennsylvania, and a board member called 
Old Man Ream from Iowa. These officers told me to return at once to Colorado, and they would call a strike of the coal miners. The strike was called November ninth, 1903. The demand was for an eight-hour day. A check by Wayman representing the miners, payment in money instead of script. The whole state of Colorado was in revolt. No coal was dug. November is a cold month in Colorado, and the citizens began to feel the pressure of the strike. Late one evening, in the latter part of November, I came into the hotel. I had been working all day and into the night, among the miners and their families, helping to distribute food and clothes, encouraging, holding meetings. As I was about to retire, the hotel clerk called me down to answer a long-distance telephone call from Louisville. The voice said, Oh, for God's sake, mother, come to us, come to us. I asked what the trouble was, and the reply was more a cry than an answer. Oh, don't wait to ask. Don't miss the train. I got Mr. Howell, the president, on the telephone and asked him what was the trouble in Louisville. They are having a convention there, he said. A convention, is it, and what for? To call off the strike in the northern coal fields, because the operators have yielded to the demands. He did not look at me as he spoke. I could see he was heart sick. But they cannot go back until the operators settle with the southern miners, I said. They will not desert their brothers until the strike is won. Are you going to let them do it? Oh, mother, he almost cried, I can't help it. It is the national headquarters who have ordered them back. That's treachery, I said. Quick, get ready and come with me. We telephoned down to the station to have the conductor hold the train for Louisville a few minutes. This he did. We got into Louisville the next morning. I had not slept. The board member, Ream, and Grant Hamilton, representing the Federation of Labor, came to the hotel where I was stopping and asked where Mr. Howell, the president, was. He has just stepped out, I said. He will be back. Well, meantime, I want to notify you, Ream said, that you must not block the settlement of the northern miners because the national president, John Mitchell, wants it, and he pays you. Are you through? said I. He nodded. Then I'm going to tell you that if God Almighty wants this strike called off for his benefit, and not for the miners, I am going to raise my voice against it. And as to President John paying me, he never paid me a penny in his life. It is the hard-earned nickels and dimes of the miners that pay me, and it is their interest that I am going to serve. I went to the convention and heard the matter of the northern miners returning to the mines discussed. I watched two shrewd diplomats deal with unsophisticated men. Strubby, the president of the northern coal fields, and Blood, one of the keenest, trickiest lawyers in the West. And behind them, John Mitchell, toasted and wined and dined, flattered and cajoled by the Denver's Citizens' Alliance. And the Civic Federation was pulling the strings. In the afternoon, the miners called on me to address the convention. Brothers, I said, you English-speaking miners of the northern fields promised your southern brothers, seventy percent of whom do not speak English, that you would support them to the end. Now you are asked to betray them, to make a separate settlement. You have a common enemy, and it is your duty to fight to a finish. The enemy seeks to conquer by dividing your ranks, by making distinctions between North and South, between American and foreign. You are all miners, 
fighting a common cause, a common master. The iron heel feels the same to all flesh. Hunger and suffering and the cause of your children bind more closely than a common tongue. I am accused of helping the Western Federation of Miners, as if that were a crime, by one of the national board members. I plead guilty. I know no east or west, north nor south, when it comes to my class fighting the battle for justice. It is my fortune to live to see the industrial chain broken from every working man's child in America. And if then there is one black child in Africa in bondage, there shall I go. The delegates rose en masse to cheer. The vote was taken. The majority decided to stand by the southern miners, refusing to obey the national president. 